It was an immense project. I was to extract one decagram of myelin from four tons of earthworms. Really? Yes. I was on that project for five years. I was the only one who believed in it. Everyone else said it couldn't be done. It can't. I know that now. I proved it. So here we are again, going after Thunderfoot. Not going after Thunderfoot, pointing out that Thunderfoot is probably wrong. So he's not backing down from his position, and I'm not backing down from mine. Well, credentials don't really matter when we're talking about the truth or the, the reality that we're dealing with. But sometimes we just want to say, well, who are we listening to and why are we listening to him? Well, he's a scientist. He makes YouTube videos. He has a high-speed camera. We should listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. Well, unfortunately for him and unfortunately for us, it makes it a little harder when you get someone like Elon Musk, his credentials. He's an engineer, CEO, that makes rockets that land on floating barges at sea. It, let's just say it's a little bit more difficult to make rockets at land than it is to make YouTube videos telling people what you can't do. Now, Peter Diamandis is a person that actually believes in Elon Musk, and he's one of the last people to say that if Elon Musk says it can be done, it can't be done, right? And he also has something to say about people that say things can't be done. You get what you incentivize, meaning you got to create an incentive program. So that's kind of what Elon is doing. If you think it's impossible, then it is for you. Now... The thing I liked about this was one I most pertinent to Thunderbird is an expert is someone you can tell exactly how it can't be done. And of course, 22, the day before something is a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. Now, credentials matter in this case. And so if Elon Musk says it can be done, it's just assumed it can be done. Should you assume it? Of course not. You should never assume it. In fact, I was concerned with Elon Musk. I heard about him, and I was like, ah, he's, he can't be that knowledgeable. So what do you do? You research him. So I researched him, and I, it turns out he's pretty much as advertised. Um, yeah, there's some hyperbole that surrounds him, but for the most part, he is pretty much the real deal. He is also extremely lucky. Um, but he worked for it. It's funny how um, the more you try, the luckier you get. I mean, he worked hard. He risked everything for SpaceX and for Tesla. Almost failed. Had he not got a, um, a government loan, it would have failed. SpaceX almost failed. Two rockets failed. He didn't have money for a third rocket, but he scraped it together and did a third one, was successful, and got a NASA contract, which saved his bacon completely. Um, he suggested the high Hyperloop, which gives the Hyperloop credibility. Um, because he said it. You know, if you have... If Einstein said it, if someone said it who was of that caliber said it, and he is of that caliber, whether you believe it or not, you know, you have to take what he says seriously. But no one is beyond criticism. He's starting a boring project. Now, this is actually problematic, and I'll talk about that at the end. But at the end of the day, he gets sh shut down. Now that doesn't actually work. It was supposed to say shit done, down, done. And now it says get shut down. Yeah, well, we'll see about him getting shut down. Maybe it was a Floridian, a Floridian, Floridian slip there. We'll see how that works out. Constructive criticism is good. So, absolutely, he should be criticized. I have no problem with that whatsoever. 
if I thought the Hyperloop was impossible, I would be right there with Phil saying, good, good, good get. Hey, you pointed out a really good, good one because it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, all kinds of reasons not to construct the damn thing. Well, the Hyperloop test track, however, proved some facts. And one thing is, vacuum's not so hard. I mean, it, it, they demonstrated that they could evacuate the tube within, uh, they, in 30 minutes. And that means they can evacuate any tube of any size in about 30 minutes. No fundamental difference between one mile or 350 miles from the test track um, proposition. There's going to be no fundamental changes. I don't care how long you make it. Uh, you're going to be able to evacuate it as long as you continue to have that number of um, pumps pumping out the track. Turbulent. Now, in one of the designs they showed was the one with a turbine in, in, in front, and I don't show it here, un unfortunately. But um, that actually does have to do with air, and I thought it was use useless. So I, w I was wrong. I was wrong. There, there's actually use, in, and it's a part of a real design because there is some air in it, even though it's very little. The faster you go, it causes that air to become. An issue, especially when you get really close to the edge of the tube itself. So there's an air pocket between you and the tube, um, which, and if you think about it, the tube itself is is problematic because it is building up pressure. So this only works if you evacuate the tube. I mean, tube designs just don't work. Period. You have to evacuate the tube to have a really good tube design or have it really big so there's not a lot of air buildup. So subways have to have a lot of airflow in order for them not to be um, slowed down significantly because of the air. Um, dust phenomenon. And I, I put this here because he kind of went off in his criticism on this dust cloud. I'm like, I, who the fuck cares about a dust cloud? How does that have to do anything with the function of the tube? And I put this here, Twilight of the Elite. And one of the things that Thunderfoot is demonstrating, Phil Mason is demonstrating here, is really an elitist attitude. And he goes off to the test track and he's saying, oh, why are you having college students do this testing? Why don't you have professional engineers that it's such an easy thing to build? Because there are some fundamental issues that need to be worked out. And it's a good opportunity to bring in outsiders' perspective. Uh, creative outlet. It's a, it's actually a, a known and proven uh, technique for f for developing new ideas, or finding new solutions to old ideas. Create a contest, incentivize it, make it interesting, and that's what they're doing, and that's why they're doing it. Peter Diamandis has a lot to do with the way um, Silicon Valley thinks about incentivizing both internally and externally for uh, competitions. And this, of course, is my argument. He's criticizing they didn't do very good. The fastest was like 58 miles an hour or whatever um, that completed the track. And he's all over it. Blah, 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 man. You can't walk. You know, this isn't... You're not being successful. And, of course, I'm using the example of, hey, kids, when they first start to learn to walk, I mean, they don't look like they'll ever learn to rock. But, of course, they do. It's a learning process. So, do you club baby seals, too? You know? Now, this is something he says. It's just factually inaccurate. Practical costs go up exponentially as the thing gets bigger. Really? Where are those num numbers? It, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's If you demonstrate you can do it for a mile, you can do it for 350 miles. It, it's not going to increase the overall cost, assuming you're keeping the same model. So if the same size track, you just multiply that by 350, and you have the answer of the cost for the track. This doesn't include land costs. This doesn't include on-ramps. This doesn't include off-ramps. It doesn't include all kinds of potential things you might want to add to your track. But in general, 
the cost does not go up substantial uh, at all. In fact, it goes down as you um, build more of the track. Now, Infinite Link's test track. Now, this is actually the test track that they want to build. Um, they haven't built this yet. Um, there's a couple people that are suggesting to build a track like this. So you have a loop, and that way you can test the speed of the um, your pods without ha actually having to worry about ending their test. So this is something that we will see in probably the not too distant future to answer the question of you do need a longer track. This first test was really about um, putting it put your pod in a vacuum um, um, vacuumed environment and that was the big, biggest problem that all the engineers had to deal with and so the vacuum I issue is a big issue from a pod design standpoint exponentials so one thing I want to talk about is just metal in general um, so what I'm saying here is if, if you can demonstrate that distance here you can do it you can replicate that model as, as far as you want it to go um, there really is no dif difference between one mile and 350 miles uh, I'd really like to see you prove that to be true in this case there are examples of exponentials this is not one of them and there was some guy that mentioned, oh, you're going to have this track in an earthquake-prone zone. I said, yeah, and that's a big deal because metal works wonderfully. It bends, it shakes, it wiggles, it does all that beautiful stuff that metal... Don't think of metal as fragile. It's not fragile like glass. It doesn't crack in, in, in general. I mean, if you engineer it right, you get a nice bouncy, slinky type of effect with metal. So... And then these properties are determined by the manufacturer of the pipes themselves. So yeah, we don't know the actual properties of the metal that's being used unless we actually know what the metal is that's being used. So some metals wouldn't be appropriate for a hyperloop. Other metals would. But in general, it's a very, very safe um, material to work with. It doesn't have the bad characters. All modern buildings are built out of metal. If you want to make a really tall building, you're going to make it out of metal. Now the thermal issue was solved. Um, there's a nice video about this, the Hyperloop thermal expansion. You can uh, Google that, or I'll have a link in the low bar <laughs> explaining that particular thermal expansion. It's actually a lot cheaper than my assumption. Um, he explains just how you would probably go about solving this issue because it has to do with fundamental properties of metal. Now. I don't think you should make a statement unless you're willing to back it up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a long bet on metacalculus.com and I will put something like this in there and if you want to bet on, on it, we can all bet on it and we can see who's going to be right in the end. But I'd be curious to see what pe people think and, and you do. You know, you think I'm wrong, you think uh, Th Thunderfoot is wrong. But I'm saying here that by July 1st, 2014, we will have a 100 mile long commercial track. It has to be commercial, meaning it has to be moving cargo or passengers. And it has to be able to have pods going at 400 miles an hour or faster. Um, and I think that's a good bet. So if you think I'm right or wrong, go ahead and comment in low bar or, or go to Met Metacalculus and actually create an account and actually make a long bet on that. Um, I want to get back to the boring problem. Um, one thing I don't think is going to happen is California is going to get a hyperloop. Um, now, the one reason Elon Musk is starting a boring company or is it playing with boring equipment is because um, to solve a lot of congestion problems, you're going to have to go below ground. Um, it's just not practical to go above ground which means that you need to put holes in the ground. Now, there are all kinds of problems associated with digging holes in the ground. Um, and Elon Musk is going to discover all of them, I'm sure. And he's well aware that he doesn't know what's going on. And so, uh, but one way to find out is to actually do it, to actually experiment with it. And that's sort of 
Elon's way of doing things. If he doesn't like the answer he gets, if it doesn't make fundamental sense, then he's going to go and experiment until he's satisfied that he understands the problem sufficiently, which is how he started SpaceX to begin with. It was like, well, I want to get a rocket to Mars. How am I going to do, do that? And when he investigated, he says, well, this really sucks. And he decided, well, to solve the problem, I need to start my own rocket company. Um, and that's how SpaceX got created. So who knows what's going to happen with a boring company. Maybe he'll realize, oh, that's just too damn hard, and he'll give up on the problem. Um, but land use in California is a real cost of the any high-speed rail or hyperloop. You have the land acquisition cost. And so I just don't see that's going to be very practical. Probably in Dubai or you know other countries, this might be the issue and as you also use it um, going underwater I mean that's potentially a place you could use it I mean there's, there's other a applications for where you would put a hyperloop that's why I'm saying that there should be a hyperloop by a hundred miles long by the end of uh, or the beginning of uh, July 1st 2024 so and that is my ar argument